Welcome back to Northwest City Politics in the Know with Juanita. We're so glad that you're joining us for our program this evening. We're very happy there are people like you out there that are interested in the issues that are happening in our cities. If you haven't watched our program before, each week we'll have someone on from one of the nine cities in CCX's viewing area to update us on what's been happening on that city and what are some issues that you should know that are coming ahead. And we do encourage you, if you're from that city, be sure to take down their email and phone number and be in contact with them if there's some issues that concern you. Tonight, we're very happy to have as a guest, Steve Smithgall, who's from the Golden Valley City Council. We're glad to have you back. It's been a long time, right? It absolutely yeah. has. I'm very thrilled to be here. I was very pleased when you called me. Our meetings are too few and far between. That's true, that's true. <laughs> and I'll let you introduce yourself out to our wider audience. People in Golden Valley probably know you, but we were covering nine cities. If you'll tell them a little bit about your background in Golden Valley and on the council. Well, my wife and I have lived in Golden Valley for about 36 years. Ah. And um, the early part of those years, I was mainly involved in, in the school district. I was involved in the schools, uh, Neal Elementary, Sandberg Middle School, and uh, Cooper High School ah. as our daughters. Uh, went through the program. After they graduated and left the area, I had a little more time on my hands and uh, got myself appointed to the Planning Commission. Oh, yeah. I took over Bob Schaefer's seat mm -hmm. on the Planning Commission. I was on the Planning Commission for nine years. Ah. Then as you may recall, uh, Mike Freiberg left the Golden Valley City Council after one year on the council, he right. was a, he was uh, ran for and was elected as a state representative. So, I was appointed by the sitting council okay. members to serve his second year, sure. and then I ran in a special election and won that to serve uh -huh. his third and fourth year, right. and uh, and I've since won a an election of my own right. for my a four year term, of which I am currently serving the third year. Uh -huh. so. And then I asked you to think about what do you hear most from people in the city when they're approaching you about city council issues? What, well, are, they, what are they interested in or concerned about? I think the, uh, the comments that we hear from people fall into the, into the four main areas that we as a council sat down, I'm going to say it was three or four years ago and had a uh, uh, planning uh -huh. session and we decided the four things we needed to do were uh, fiscal responsibility, right. uh, effective governance, mm -hmm. infrastructure maintenance and enhancement, and targeted development. Ah. And to this day, I believe those four things are really the business of city right. government. Right. And as we're going to talk about here, uh, we've got a number of developments going on in Golden oh, Valley. Oh, you do. Golden Valley has um, been doing a lot infrastructure, of infrastructure, and uh, we hear a lot about this time of year there's so much road construction oh, and right, such like right. going on so we, we hear about that orange cones uh, wherever you look <laughs> yeah that's right uh we've had really gratifying feedback on the brookview ah. community center which has been uh very gratifying then i thought we'd start out with uh golden valley is the first in minnesota i think to get involved in the lime bike program Yes. And some people might not be aware of just what is that, so maybe you can give a kind of a brief sure. summary of what uh, it entails. We were very excited to be uh, the first community in Minnesota to be approached with this. Lime bikes are available in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, Seattle, Washington. I was in Berlin this oh. summer. There were lime bikes in oh, Berlin. Wow, cool. It's a bike rental program. Uh -huh. It's called Dockless okay. uh, Rental. Uh, in contrast with uh, Nice Ride Minnesota, uh -huh. which I'm also a member of, and there are no Nice Ride stations in Golden Valley, but Nice Ride bikes, you rent them from a station and then right. you have to return them to a station. Whereas Lime bikes, you can look on a, you get an app on your phone okay. and you look on the app and you find out where the nearest bike is and you can go there. You can unlock that bike using an app right. on your phone, ride it to wherever you want to go lock the bike up again and, and just walk away and leave uh -huh. it there. Uh, there's rules about not leaving it 
in private property oh, or sure, in sure. the middle of right. public roadways, of course. <laughs> right. uh, but uh, it can be very convenient if a bike happens to be near mm -hmm. where, you, where you want one. And then when did you start the program? It was just, I think the it's program just started summer, right? uh, just recently right. in July. There were some, uh, uh, the Lyme folks had some issues finding a, a warehouse space okay. in, in Golden Valley. And then um, there's some staffing that needs to be uh -huh. done. So uh, we, it was a little bit later than right. expected. And, and, uh, but we're still going to have a pretty good trial period by the end of this season. And then how many bikes do they have placed in your city approximately? Lyme started out with an original placement of 50 bicycles okay. in Golden Valley. And I am i can't say for sure whether additional bikes have been added uh -huh. since then, but Lyme bikes are also available in uh, Minneapolis, Edina, St. Paul. Uh -huh. So as the bikes kind of move around the area, it's kind of hard to yeah, to be keep sure where they started, you know. But they have some technology, so they know where their bikes are. I think right? it works like a cell phone. Oh, yeah, okay, the Lyme sure. people are able to track where every bike is. Um, one day, I rented a Lyme scooter okay. in Minneapolis. Ah. That's the same company, right. but I wanted to move it across the street before I started it up. And as I carried it across the street, it hollered at me and said, <laughs> "Leave me alone! I'll call the police." <laughs> So if you do try to move the bikes ah, or the scooters without unlocking before you're them, ready to, uh, they threaten to call the police ah, whether they actually yeah, do or not. I do don't or know. Not. Yeah, all these things that technology makes possible yes, nowadays yeah. is kind of interesting. Yep. So I don't think we need to worry about the bikes going missing. Right. They're pretty closely tracked. Now they, now they must have a website, and you must have some information about them on your city council site, right? A well, uh, if you just if you just Google Lime, yeah, um, it's. Um, it's just called Lime, and they right. have the scooters and the bikes. I, we may have a link on our city website. Yeah, I, I, I know guess there I, was some when information. I, when I downloaded about it. the app, I just went to, to Lime. And that, yeah, because that's a starting point. Yes. And then they'd be able to just follow along, and then they're ready to use them. Yep. What you do is you, uh, they'll ask you to to make a, a deposit of like twenty dollars okay. or whatever, from your credit card, and <clears throat> then as you use the bike, they uh, they draw that money down. Yeah, so, so you don't have to worry about the timing or anything because because you've already covered it. Right, yep. And now, have you had any response back from other people in the city about what they think about it or what's happened with it or? Well, I do uh, occasionally see people riding around on okay. the Lime bikes and enjoying it. Um, I've seen some Lime bikes that are unfortunately placed, like kind of le leaning in the, on the curb or oh, something like yeah. that. And there was a once a line bike in the middle of the pedestrian bridge over Ooh. Highway 55, and I thought, that's just got to be a prank. Nobody right, would right. want to start or end no, a trip up there. I don't there. think so. Uh, so, but um, they keep moving around, so okay. I consider that a good sign. Oh, I, right, I think we're right. going to, uh, I'm hopeful that we'll look back on this trial period as a success and that we'll maybe roll it out bigger next year. Sure. So the trial period was from sometime in July till when? Till the end of the season. Okay. Um, I know that the uh, the nice ride bikes are taken in in early November, and okay. I assume it'd be s similar for the line bikes. And I suppose that that they either a have a set schedule or they go by the weather. I unfortunately I think they have a set schedule because okay. last year they took the line bikes in in November and we had many yeah, days I know. of nice That's weather, a, yeah. and I, <laughs> when you could I was have been uh, using unable them, to right. ride them after right. that. So. Well, it's uh, it's good to be trying out something new and see how it oh, yeah. works, but it seems like a good idea. Between nice ride bikes and Lime scooters, uh, it fills in a gap in my commute. Uh -huh. uh, when I go to work, I park at a parking ramp that's uh -huh. uh, six-tenths of a mile from where okay. my actual office is. And so pretty much every morning and every afternoon, I'll ride either a nice ride bike or a Lime scooter. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, that makes it. That's a handy use of it. Yeah, it allows me to have a, a very nice parking place and still be able to get to my ah. place of work. So, so we'll have to check in on that next year sometime and see what's happening yes, with yes. it. Yes, uh, I myself will be curious to see what happens. Well, and I know year. other cities are looking into it too. Oh, it's, uh, I got the impression from the Lyme people that uh, it would be quite some time before they reach their full capacity. Ah. So. Well, now we'll switch to a whole different topic. Uh, I think, I'm not sure how long ago, but within the past year, uh, Golden Valley hired a new city manager. What kind of qualities was your council looking for as you were looking for a new city manager? 
Well, we we had an excellent city manager mm -hmm. before, right. and he elected to retire. Uh, so we wanted a city manager with good leadership okay. skills, a uh, good level of professionalism, and we um, we narrowed the field down to five candidates. Okay. And we had a two-person panel of city council members uh -huh. interview those five. And the reason for that I found very interesting. Okay. If the entire council would have interviewed the candidates, yeah. it would have been a public meeting by law. Right. And then the identities of the candidates oh, would have been revealed. Right, right. Possibly jeopardizing their current right, assignment. Right. So, so we had a two-member panel. And they interviewed the five, and they presented us with three finalists. Uh -huh. And uh, Mr. Cruikshank um, just um, just stood out. He just seemed uh -huh. exactly perfect for the job, and he's done an outstanding job. He's got the leadership we were looking uh -huh. for. He's got the professionalism we were looking for, and he's uh, uh, got the customer service focus. Uh -huh. Oh, important! I have no right. problem at all. Any resident of Golden Valley that contacts me over any issue, uh -huh. I'll refer it to Mr. Cruikshank or I'll ask the individual to contact yeah. Mr. Cruikshank. He's, uh, he's the gatekeeper, ah. he's the, he, he'll find the right people uh, to resolve the, any issue. Now, now, you've been involved with the Golden Valley Historical Society and oh, yeah. a lot of people probably are aware of it, but uh, some people might not be. Maybe you can tell us about how long has it been in existence, where it's located, what are some of the things they've done? Well, many people may not know, but the, uh, the city of Golden Valley actually provides uh, funding to the Golden Valley Historical okay. Society each year in the amount of $5,000. And the Golden Valley Historical Society is obliged to match those funds. Okay. And the funding is to be spent on education. Mm -hmm. Because of that relationship, the city council always has a liaison oh, right, on the Historical right. Society, which happens to be me uh -huh. for the last couple of years. Uh -huh. And uh, I hung around there so much, I actually got elected vice president uh -huh. of the Golden Valley Historical Society. So. Um, the society was founded in 1973. Ooh, a long time ago. Yeah, it's been in. Yeah. It's been around a long time, and right now it's located in the historic church building. Mm -hmm. At uh, I looked up the address, 6731 Golden Valley Road. It's um, uh, very near the entrance to Golden Valley Golf and Country right. Club. Right. And uh, in a very exciting t a turn of events, we were able. Uh, through some public funding from uh, the Minnesota Heritage Fund uh -huh. and through uh, private donations, some fairly generous ones, we were able to build a brand new addition onto the historic uh -huh. church. And I'm pleased to say that uh, uh, Bob Schaefer was the architect okay. and he did a fantastic job of mimicking the details uh -huh. of the old building. So you don't so, know where it's Yeah, like it's, it's, uh, it's a beautiful match. Uh -huh. And... Uh, we were able to, uh, with Golden Valley Historical Society funding and uh, Heritage Fund, we were able to create a script for okay. an exhibit of the history of ah. Golden Valley. And I'm pleased and proud to say that that exhibit is complete now, completely ah. installed, and it's going to open to the public on September 22nd, oh, Saturday at soon. noon. Coming up soon. And um, I'm so excited because I feel like... Uh, the Golden Valley Historical Society has been kind of laboring, uh, un, unsung, uh -huh, right, and uh, right. I feel like this is really going to put the Historical Society uh, in people's consciousness oh, right, and right. a great opportunity for residents to learn about the history of their community. Oh, and then residents that are interested can also join the histor Historical Society. Oh, I would encourage course, people right. to join the Society. Um, there are several open seats on the board of directors. Oh, okay. You could even become ah. a board of director right, right away. away. Right yeah, away. No so waiting. We'll tell people out there. So, and the other thing is, uh, during the, uh, not the summer months, but all through the, the other nine months uh -huh. of the year, the Golden Valley Historical Society puts on excellent programs, uh -huh. uh, typically one a month, uh, bringing in uh, Philip Brunel has been a presenter. Doug Oman, the photographer, uh -huh. has been a presenter. Uh, fantastic programs about history of Golden Valley, 
uh, history of other um, uh, other history topics. Right. Um, Marshall Tannock is going to do one about oh. the history of the Brookview uh, country golf ah. course. Uh, it started out as a Jewish country club oh, because uh, Jews were unable to join other right. country clubs, right. so they started their own in Golden Valley, and now it's our our own Brookview. Yeah. So, uh, very. Very exciting program. Well, I think there's a growing interest in history. What came before us? Oh, I, I would, uh, I would agree, and I people out there. <laughs> Golden Valley. I don't want to sp uh, spoil anything, but there's some very, very pithy stories in the history uh -huh. of Golden Valley that you can learn about. Oh, when you right, go to the exhibit. right. Yeah, so. uh, and that's one of the things I know I enjoy about traveling is learning about the history of an area, what yeah. happened before. And yes, absolutely. Yep. Now, there have been some uh, new statute laws, regulations, I wasn't quite sure what to call them, in Golden Valley mm -hmm. to be of help to renters. That's correct, yeah. Kind of based on the fact that a lot of apartments are getting older and if people remodel them, then they up the value because they make them fancier and the people that live there then no longer have a place to live, right? Well, one one thing of. that Golden Valley has had a goodly amount of uh -huh. is uh, what's called NOAA, naturally occurring affordable uh -huh. housing. And uh, that's, um, for example, the apartments that are on Douglas Drive down from Olympia Street oh, right. uh, were an example of that. The thing that happens is as these apartment complexes age, and uh, I think something like 10 or 12 of them have been identified in Golden Valley, uh -huh. but as they age, the rents kind of decline and they right. become affordable. Right. But the thing that happened down at the end of Olympia Street is a, a developer purchased the entire complex, I believe it's four buildings. They renovated them all, putting in granite countertops uh -huh. and, and just total renovation. And were able as a result to raise the rent. Right. And unfortunately some of the f folks that had lived there before now can't afford the new right. rent. So. What we're trying to do, and I want to emphasize that Golden Valley is uh, working in concert with nine other communities oh, I wasn't aware uh, of that. To, to provide similar levels of protection uh -huh. for uh, resident, for um, in the housing right. arena. And that would include uh, Crystal and New Hope yeah. are among the communities, Minneapolis. Uh, and so I'm particularly gratified by the by the partnership with the other communities. Oh, yes. And one of the ordinances that we passed recently requires a 90-day notification okay. if uh, there's going to be a, a change in the, in the rent. And so that, unfortunately, it doesn't guarantee that the uh, renter will be able to stay in the property. Right but it gives them a guaranteed period of time to find alternative Oh, right. It's not housing. like you're out at the end of the month, kind of. And it actually, um, it might kind of separate serious developers from ones that aren't quite oh, right, so serious right. because they are going to have to plan ahead yeah. their, their efforts enough to give the residents this 90-day 90, mm -hmm. 90 notice. And the lack of affordable housing is kind of a, a growing problem. In, oh, absolutely. In the whole metropolitan oh, yes. area. Uh, yes, I've seen reports from the Metropolitan Council that indicate the number, um, the number of housing units uh -huh. overall that are going to be required by the year 2040, and then the number of affordable housing right. units, of course, go grows correspondingly. Well, and, and there's like sort of, from what I've been reading, like a two-level thing. You need affordable housing for, say, your policemen and your bus drivers and whatever as they're starting out need affordable housing. Mm -hmm. But then you also have low-income housing that's a problem too, and they're both areas that need to be dealt with. Well, earlier we talked about the arc of a person's life right. needing housing from very young to very old. Right. I think it's also important to think of the arc of a person's uh, earning power uh -huh. and be able to provide housing for uh, individuals that, as you suggest, are just starting out in a right. career. Um, and then, <laughs> thankfully, Golden Valley has plenty of homes for people at the other end. Right, right, right. <laughs> but uh, uh, so I think it's important to accommodate uh, all those people. And uh, 
in every community. Mm -hmm. And that's why I appreciate Golden Valley oh, right. staff working with the 10 other communities. Yeah, and it, it, like it isn't a problem of only one suburb. <laughs> so it probably does need a, a larger regional effort. Yeah, another thing that we've uh, added is uh, we have the the ability to require developers to provide affordable units either ah, right. in that development or elsewhere in the city. Uh, and that, that's good flexibility. Um, it allows them to, um, uh, the flexibility of providing them on the same premises as the actual development or, uh, or nearby. And, and, and this also gets tied in with the Metropolitan Council who's concerned about that same issue. Maybe you can talk to that a little bit about, I know there was some debate by some cities on being assigned a certain percentage of housing that they should put in and debate about mm -hmm. what is already affordable. And maybe you could talk to that a little bit from your background. The, as I understand it, the Metropolitan Council is, uh, uh, when it comes to housing, they're um, more of a recommending right, body right, or a tracking right, body. Right. They can't actually force communities no. to, use to provide the affordable housing. But any community, including Golden Valley, is aware of the need to do that and is taking steps. And again, you know, the 10 communities are uh -huh. all working together to take steps to put into place these uh, protections, whether it's 90 days or 120 days, okay. uh, to require developers to provide affordable housing or uh, uh, other steps to protect afford the stock of affordable housing. Yeah, because what you already it. have that is affordable can over time become too expensive as developers look at working on remodeling. Well, yeah, like the ones on Douglas Drive yeah. there. I mean, they were very affordable. Right. Um, but now that they've been uh, renovated, they're not so much anymore. And I remember when we've talked about it on some other programs, you also have to do something that encourages the developer to do that because the city isn't building the housing, but they need to figure out what's the structure or what are some of the and ways they can incentivize the process. What you don't want to do is scare developers away from your yep. community. And again, that's why I think it's so important that all the communities are working yeah. together. You don't have a particular community become a safe refuge right. for developers because the others right. have uh, requirements for affordable housing that are that are onerous. Right. Uh, so um, it may, I guess, could conceivably increase the cost of, of development, uh, but um, I think that uh, with proper management, that doesn't have to be a deal breaker. Well, and, and you get a larger group working on the, pro on the problem, then you're getting more ideas for how can we manage or deal with this. Yeah, yeah. And then we're always encouraging people to get involved with your city. We've got a few minutes. Maybe we can tell them about some of your commissions that they could get involved oh, in. Oh, yeah. And if you think of any other volunteer places for people, because we tell people out there, get involved. You get a lot back from being involved in your city. Well, I will tell you, uh, the nine years that I spent on the Planning Commission uh -huh. were extremely gratifying. It gave me an opportunity uh, to get to know the city staff, um, the city ordinance, zoning ordinances. Uh, it just gave me a tremendous knowledge of the city. We've also got a Board of Zoning Appeals, which is where if people maybe want to add on a garage to their home and it sits too close to a property line, right. under certain circumstances, uh, the Board of Zoning Appeals may recommend to the City Council that um, a required setback right. be suspended or something. We have a fantastic uh, open space and parks, ah. uh, uh, park and rec right. commission. And I think you can see the evidence of that in uh, not just Brookview, but the uh, new play structures at, at all of our sure. parks, um, renovation of the warming buildings at the parks. Uh, we've got an environmental commission, and uh, <laughs> one of the things that uh, uh, makes me chuckle a little bit is that the environmental commission spent um, 
I think the better part of two years studying uh, whether Golden Valley should allow chickens or not. Oh yeah. <laughs> and and we did. Right. And I. I uh, have some friends in St. Paul that have chickens, and it was a great educational opportunity yep. for their young oh, definitely. sons at the right. time. But um, I honestly don't think that many people have taken us up on no. chickens in Golden yeah, Valley. I, I think there's, I think more there's maybe three home, families. Two homes done the same, them. and I mean, other cities have too, that there's a lot. Sometimes there's a big uproar about not wanting that, but you don't really have that many people. Yeah. We have a Human Services Commission has oh. done a great job of raising funds. Uh, they do a, um, a golf event and a run uh, to raise funds and then these funds are awarded to uh, various charitable organizations. It tends to be the same, more or less same slate of organizations each year but they focus on organizations that are delivering ah. service to Golden Valley residents. Ah. So if you're inclined to serve on that commission or contribute money to uh -huh. it, um, you're, you're very likely uh, affecting residents of Golden Valley, so um, so that's a that's a good group to be. And, part and of people too. can um, go on the website and look at minutes, but they could also go to any of the meetings that are held, or talk to people in City Hall about what's involved. So, what your interest is, and you can match it up with one of these commissions, then yep. you can be a value yep. to your city. I'm leaving off a number of commissions, I'm sure, but ah, uh, yeah, the but city I, council right. relies on, on those. Uh, oh, yeah, because the, all of these commissions do a lot of the gathering of information and finding out all the parts and pieces that need to be put together yeah. and then bring it to the council. Yeah, to, they make recommendations, right. and uh, rarely does the city council uh, uh, not follow right. the commission's recommendations. Right. Those are... Um, uh, hard-working, serious mm -hmm. volunteers, and uh, uh, generally we respect their decisions. Yeah, so it's a, a good opportunity for people if they have have some time in their schedule. Not when as your life moves on, at some points you're yeah. too busy, but at other points you'll have the time, and you should consider giving some of that time to your city. I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. One thing that we uh, had talked about is. Uh, um, new businesses in Golden oh, Valley. Oh, right, uh, right. I, I did want to mention a couple of those. Oh, yes, um, do that. The, you may notice that the old Perkins, which used to be right. on 55 at uh, near Boone Avenue, right. has been renovated into Latitude 14. Yeah, it's I saw that. I haven't been, is Asian, it, have they it's opened not up? open yet. I didn't think they were open Asian yet. fusion restaurant. Yeah. It's owned by the same people that own Lemongrass in, yeah. I think it's Brooklyn Park. Uh, award-winning delicious yeah. looking food on their website right. I can't wait to <laughs> try it out and then uh, across the street to the north from that location is gonna be our own Golden Valley's brewery oh. under pressure brewing uh -huh. I stopped in a couple Saturdays ago they're feverishly working in there to uh -huh. finish that up and so. well I want to thank you very much for coming out this evening and telling our audience about what's happening in Golden Valley. We'll encourage you to tune in next week for part two on Golden Valley issues. We're glad that you're with us and we hope you'll join us again next week. Bye.